All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas. I'm from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, I'll start off and preface this by saying I am not a Jupyter user myself. There are few use cases for me, although I do happen to use our Jupyter instance. So I know. I just leave right now. It's very useful. <laughs> but it is very useful for me. Uh, just seeing the talks yesterday and talking to some of you to get some of a uh, better idea of use cases and what it is that people are looking for when they are using Jupyter. Um, so today, anyway, I wanted to talk about our deployment at LLNL. Uh, it's fairly similar to the one at NERSC with a few different variations. I kind of think of us as like the Galapagos finches in a way. Kind of cool. Uh, some similar features, but just different enough. So the motivation behind this was we were repeatedly asked by LC users uh, whether or not uh, they could use Jupyter, and we would always tell them no. Uh, and so Livermore Computing were generally suspicious of any web server-based applications because they're bypass Unix permissions. And that's, that's really the big one, because at an NS NNSA lab, we have a requirement to make sure that user data belongs to that user. Um, because while most of the things that people work with are unclassified, and we do have classified computing as well, uh, some of that is a little bit more sensitive nature. For example, ACNI, um, which is, I don't remember, unclassified controlled nuclear information, something like that. So we can't let people share data. And as a simple example of this, if I were to type into my terminal Python, dash M, simple HTTP server, HTTP server, I forget what it is. Now, all the files in my home directory are available to anybody else that happens to be on the same machine and can find my server running on localhost on whatever port. Um, so we would just flat out say no, and eventually they said, okay, you know, there's enough people knocking at our door. Can we do something about this? Can we, can we give it to them? And so that's what I started um, looking at. Oh, who's the, who the we when they said there's people knocking at our door. Uh, so we have, we have um, what's called our hotline, our LC hotline. It's kind of our user. Uh, users will call into the hotline and they will ask for features or they'll ask for help with HP. So we would get a frequent, uh, we would frequently get people calling in saying, why did you kill my Jupyter notebook? And we would point them to the page that says, you're not allowed to run Jupyter notebooks. Uh, but we had this happen on such a regular basis that they said, can we, I don't know, people want it. <laughs> it must be something. Um, and it is. So uh, just to, to give a brief demo, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna run a Jupyter notebook. Um, cool. All right, so I've got that. And I've got my little demo thing here. Oh, right, yes, I should start a notebook first. Um, got this. So I've started a kernel, a notebook running, and now I'm going to start up this little tool that I have and go ahead and run something. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's part of the demo. <laughs> realize the crowd you're talking to, right? Yes, I, I realize the crowd we're talking to. But, Part of this is, is to demonstrate that, uh, so you'll notice here my super secret password. <laughs> uh, I can, as it stands, bind to any open notebook. So if I happen to be on the same machine that you're running on, I can connect to your notebook, I can read everything that you're doing, and most might not care. You know, some people do try to connect to MySQL. Some people try to connect to other services and they'll type a password just like I did right there. Uh, and so that's available. So you can spy on your friends right now. It wasn't very hard for me to put together this demo. It's, uh, it's quite easy to do. Uh, so we really like the Jupyter Hub model. So in searching around, as I start um, going through and trying to uh, 
I should probably turn that off. As I started looking at Jupiter, we really like the Jupiter Hub model. We like it when people are running as themselves because then we can let standard Unix permissions take over and just go from there. Um, the only thing we didn't really like is what I just showed you, uh, that you can just bind to an arbitrary notebook that you happen to be uh, nearby on the same host, and also that the, the connections between the hub and individual notebooks, those are all unencrypted as well. So even though you have HTTPS from your browser, uh, from the proxy onward, uh, that's, that's all in the clear. So uh, if I happen to be able to dump traffic, I can also watch what you're doing there. Um, so what we ended up doing is something fairly similar to what they have at, at NERST. I have a central Jupyter Hub host uh, where Hub and CHP are running. And what I do is I, uh, yeah, I should probably mention the feature. So I, I set up a mechanism to assign two certs on the fly to each of these components so that we can turn on SSL because the notebook does have to do that. However, I will add the little asterisk that that does not mitigate against the, the, the previous threat that I mentioned or just demonstrated um, because in practice it's a little bit harder to uh, propagate those certs to the zero and Q sockets that are just because of the way um, the client kernel architecture is set up. Uh, so right now what we do, what we currently do is we set it up such that all of the connections between hub components and individual notebooks is, are secured by SSL, CLS, and in between the notebook and an individual kernel, we turn on the IPC transport. So we use a, a Unix domain socket instead, which is scoped to your user. Uh, so as only you, uh, as long as we can enforce Unix permissions, we can enforce who happens to be able to bind to that kernel. And so those notebooks are launched onto various login nodes within the center. I actually populate a list of available login nodes from another endpoint that we have. Um, and then users like Tom uh, are able to connect to, you know, uh, potentially another kernel running out in an allocation to, to do their work. That's, that's kind of the fuzzy piece that hasn't quite been completed yet. Um, so this is just a, a, a breakdown of that. Um, I set up the internal SSL modifications so that these things can uh, talk to each other encrypted. Uh, and we also have a custom authenticator as well. Very, very, very similar setup. The only other difference, I guess, is I, I tie into our single sign-on, which does have some advantages too, because I, I think I heard some folks mention that they were looking to, like, how do I propagate auth to other services? So if for us, um, I set up each service in LC to support single sign-on. So now that JupyterHub knows about that, I can, in theory, talk to anything else using the same uh, login as before. So every other service, it's pretty seamless. You log in once and now you get Jupyter, you get everything else that we offer, all the Atlassian tools, et cetera. And there's the bridge kernel, as I mentioned, that, that's, that's kind of the thing that Tom was using. But what I'd like to move to is, which I think you also had experimented with at one point in time, is launching a kernel remotely from the login node. So instead of having something like the batch spawner, um, we would launch on the, the, the login node, and then from there, the user can select options to launch their individual kernel, and that would do the allocation and tunnel back so that we can, I think it's a little bit more of a, at least in my mind, it seems like a little bit more of a natural workflow and then we could just let the, the native scheduler handle everything and not really have to worry about exposing that um, via an API. Um, yeah, and so as I, as I just mentioned, those, that's kind of the future path that, that I want to go down for uh, batch spawning and also so I, I kind of glossed over it, but we're using IPC sockets right now to, to protect that client kernel communication. Uh, it would be really nice to get back to the TCP socket version of that because there are some kernels which don't support IPC. 
Um, and it hasn't been too much of a problem for us yet, but that, you know, I, I foresee somebody's going to ask for it. Um, the difficulty there being it, it's a little bit more of a delicate thing to change because that would cause uh, complications with other, you know, kernel developers, custom kernel developers. So I talked to Min about this a little bit, and I just haven't quite gotten around to and to implementing it. But it should be fairly straightforward once I sit down and actually do it. Um, so yeah, any questions on that? I'm pretty fast and pretty straightforward. I don't want to bore you with too many repeated details. <laughs> this, uh, is your software available? <laughs> The configuration, uh, by configurations, you mean for this entire setup? Yeah. So the SSL parts are part of each of their The spawner itself, I think we have released, although that, that needs some, some cleanup. The crowd operator, I haven't released, and I don't think, I, I've been trying to get that one out. I don't think they're going to let me. Is, is Chrome, is that an Alassian? Yeah, Chrome is an Alassian tool. Um, it just happens to be what we used because it, it kind of evolved around our use of, of the Atlassian tools. But um, we do some interesting things with that as well, where like we have a web server where you run processes as yourself as well. And that workflow is kind of built into crowd. So that's why we, that's kind of why we have it. Um, but the single sign on technique, I think I could probably document how it is that I kind of, uh, take over the login process to do that um, and maybe publish something about that. How are you passing in Kerberos? So Kerberos, yeah, this is kind of a workflow that happens with Crowd, but basically once it sees the SSO token, I validate the session, that session, and I get information back that allows me to run K in it, and then I just uh, use that to... Uh, to allow for SSH. Um, does that happen elements. in the spawner or does that happen, where does that occur? I have that in the spawner, yeah. Or, yeah, so, yeah, the, the hub host is running as root. I use that to attach and run SSH out to an individual host. Um, but it, you know, it, it has afforded some advantages. I, it is kind of kludgy in, in some ways as well, uh, but it, 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 it works. And when you have you know, some methods to address certain difficulties, like number one was the extension management business. Like right now, we don't, part of that data sharing thing is like we don't let other people see extensions. So installing them globally, not an option. Um, but we have been able to, uh, and I don't remember, we were talking about it yesterday, we have been able to set it up to where uh, Tom was able to set up a custom version of JupyterLab, set an environment variable, and before I actually launch a notebook, I will source the remote environment and then set those before notebook launch. And so he's actually able to use his own JupyterLab deployment instead of the one that we provide globally. So it's kind of a workaround, but it's, you know. That's what we're doing. Oh, okay. So we have a, like a magic file we look for, and if we see that, it's there. Got it. Yeah, I mean, it works. <laughs> it gets people by. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, do you guys just distrust containerization? I mean, it seems like a lot of this having to isolate users. Like, if you trust your container, or if you have lightweight VM boundaries, like you could just have one user in a thing, and it would get there would be a lot less complexity in the orchestration. So currently, yes, we do distrust users in that sense. We don't let any standard user run Docker. Um, at escalation, that whole business. In fact, our dockers are modified that no standard user could touch them. Uh, so it's only for admin purposes. That's, okay. I mean, it's something that we're looking at because we would like, it, it's, a, it's a hard thing. I watch from the back and like, with like dream guys, like, oh man, I see all the things that you guys have. I'm like, I want nice things. <laughs> that would be great. Developed for singularity, which addresses some of the dumpster fire. So, so yeah, I am I am looking into that. There, yeah, singularity has been compelling. 
Uh, and we do support that, but I mean, right now, the biggest push is for sure. just like the actual HPC applications. But I am looking to use that for something like this. Um, how, do you, how does your hacking tool get around Jupyter's token? So there is a token, and I think I know which one you're talking about. That's to sign requests to execute something. Um, but that's all the tokens for it. So I can't submit, even though I can bind to the, that kernel, I can't submit jobs as you. That token keeps that part safe. But all of the traffic is in clear. So, that, so I can bind to any of those published ports and just listen and read. Um, yeah, and the solution that I was looking at is that, because right now there's no place to insert the actual use of SSL for the sockets. And so the, the suggestion was to take and set a proxy which sets up a set of 10 ports, one on a, a, for the client and one for the kernel. And that proxy would actually set up, would take the, the certs that I generate from the hub and use those to, to stand up SSL. But now I'm eating up 10 ports instead of five. Not, not the end of the world, but just kind of. <laughs> Has there been talk of using this upstream Gmail? Uh, which which part? Uh, it is. It's in there. Uh, it's in there now. Uh, and, but and uh, it should be end to end SSL asterisk because of this. Because I, I I specifically started in Jupyter Hub, but the other change that I'm talking about would be between the the, the client and kernel okay. itself. So. That's, a, that's another thing that it just hasn't been high on the priority list because everybody was pretty happy with IPC. So that's what it is. And uh, you've got an SSH spawner. Uh, also, um, you mentioned that you set up a tunnel. Is uh -huh. it is persisting? Uh, in the, that tunnel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the SSH tunnel is persistent. Yes. So the poles and everything go through the tunnel? Yep. So because, uh, yeah, we can't open up any of the high number ports on the login nodes. So I set it up to just tunnel that port back. Mm -hmm. And we also have lifetimes on the notebooks. They're tied to the credential itself. So I actually modified, I didn't mention this, I modified the, um, I think it's like the single user command <laughs> to set up a timer that basically says, if I can't reach the hub, uh, kill myself. Or if I can't, uh, if I've gone over 12 hours, it's probably a better way to say that. Uh, <laughs> Self-destruct. <laughs> so not as great. Um, or if I've exceeded 12 hours, then spin it down so that I don't end up with a bunch of four from notebooks around the center. Because, okay. you know, uh, <clears throat> we get a, quite a few people watching. Okay. It does seem to be a pattern for a lot of these remote um, single user server startups to have other things going on around them on the remote side. So like grant or paper report type stuff. So that so is that a separate process that runs at the same time as a notebook or is it just uh you mean the uh self-destruct the self-destruct self I think uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but there's like a single user command that wraps the the, the standard Jupyter notebook startup. And so I just set a timer. I think I hook into the IO loop and I just set a timer and it just periodically pokes the hub, says, can I reach you? And then it looks at itself like, when did I start? Um, yeah, because we had the problem of <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that you know, things would die and not be able to, uh, like the hub would die and a notebook would just sit there and run indefinitely. And there are things that will call those, but I thought I should be a, a, a good neighbor. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, well, thanks for your time, everybody.